Welcome everyone uh, to this webinar on sexual and gender-based violence in time of COVID-19, a hidden pandemic we ask. Uh, I'm thrilled to see that so many of you have uh, signed up for this event and you have signed up from all over the world. Uh, and some of you are joining us early in the morning while others are joining us late in the evening. My name is Turin Trigista and I'm the director of the PRIO Center on Gender, Peace and Security and we are based in, in Oslo. And I will be the chair and host of this event. Uh, this webinar is co-sponsored by a consortium of sister institutes and centers around the world, the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security in Washington, DC, the LSE Center for Women, Peace and Security in London, Monash Gender, Peace and Security Center in Melbourne, Australia, and the Women, Peace and Security Institute at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center in Accra, Ghana. And this event uh, forms part of a series of uh, webinars on COVID-19 and the Women, Peace and Security agenda co-hosted by this consortium. We have had some technical problems, so I'm not sure if all those we have invited to speak will actually be able to join us, but we'll see. We are working on it. But we have already with us uh, the Secretary General, Special Representative on, on, uh, on Sexual Violence in Conflict, Pramila Patton, and we have Jackie Drew with us from Monash, and we have Inger Schelsbeck with us from the University in Oslo slash the PRIO GPS Center. Then to today's topic. On 23rd March, of the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called for a global ceasefire to put armed conflict to a lockdown. The purpose of that was to help create corridors for life-saving aid, to open windows for peace diplomacy, and to bring hope to places among the most vulnerable to COVID-19. Shortly after, he made another call, a call for measures to address what he referred to as a horrifying global surge in domestic violence directed towards women and girls linked to lockdowns imposed by governments responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. At this uh, webinar, we will ask how and in what ways the global COVID-19 pandemic has impacted sexual and gender-based violence in general, but also how COVID-19 responses have impacted women and girls and LGBTQ persons affected by conflict-related sexual violence. And as I said, to discuss this topic, we have with us today a group of distinguished speakers, uh, the Under Secretary General, Pramila Patton. We hopefully will have with us Helen Casey Nvova from the Women's International Peace Center, Lucia Barca from the Colombia Diversa, Joanna Ama Usai Tutu from the Kofi Annan Peacekeeping Training Center, Jackie Thru from the Monash uh, Gender Peace and Security Center, and Inger Schelsbeck from the University in Oslo and the PRIO GPS Center. So a little bit about the setup for this uh, webinar. Uh, we are not going to run this with prepared presentations, but rather more like a conversation. And Towards the end, there will be opportunities for a Q&A session. So we encourage you all to ask questions or provide comments in the chat function as we go along. And then my colleagues will keep an eye on the chat function and then summarize questions towards the end. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot guarantee that all questions be, will be responded to, but we will do our best. So then, without any further ado, um, I think we'll start out with um, with calling on Pramila Patton. Pramila, if I may, uh, you have been in lockdown as most of us uh, around the world. And for someone like you heading an office like the one you do, uh, where it's an important part of your job is to reach out to people, to organize a lot of meetings, to advocate for, for the prevention and, and uh, of, of conflict related sexual violence. How has it been now for you to run your office and how, how is your daily work going on? Well, good morning and good evening to, to all. Uh, indeed, I have been uh, working from home since the 13th of March. 
it's anything but business as usual. No longer working alongside your team brings a new set of challenges. And for me, from the start, it has been all about adaptable leadership. Uh, but I can say that two months down the road, I'm happy that the transition has been easier than I think. And we have been able to, uh, to ensure business continuity. Uh, how uh, I had to adapt to the new working arrangement. Initially, it was not easy for, for anyone, for myself, for my staff. But I think good communication uh, has been very important. My chief of staff and, and team leaders check on and brief me every day on the wellness of their respective team. And I've been having wellness check-in session with all my staff, uh, in addition to my daily meetings with my team leaders and my chief of staff. Without micromanaging their work, I have been very accessible to, uh, to each and every one of, of my staff by phone uh, and WhatsApp. And I think as a leader, I had to act at all times in the best interest of my staff. And also in such an atypical and challenging situation, uh, one has to be human. For example, uh, it's important to exhibit empathy. Uh, the first few weeks were extremely difficult. Uh, but for me, my staff is uh, my most valuable resource. Uh, for example, I know they are all well equipped to, to, uh, with the necessary tools to deliver. Uh, on, on, on their day-to-day -day responsibilities. But I'm, I am and I have been also very mindful of the fact that many are juggling endless tasks, uh, especially with school closed. Many of my staff have to, uh, on top of their daily uh, workload, they have children to look after and to even perform as homeschool teachers. But I think ultimately what it boils down to, the success boils down to the fact that I have full confidence in my team. And from day one, I said to myself, they have everything they need to do their job and I must step back and, and let them get on with it. In terms of substantive work, uh, more importantly, we have been working to ensure that gains in our priority countries in terms of political uh, commitments, prevention and response efforts are not rolled back uh, or, or reversed. And, uh, at the outset of the pandemic, we've reached out to all our senior women protection advisors in the field uh, for their views on the actual and perceived projected impact of COVID-19 on mandate delivery. And their findings were consolidated into a briefing note that we actually shared with the Security Council ahead of their meeting on COVID-19 and international security on 9th of April. Over the past two months, my team has drafted the annual report of the Secretary General on conflict-related sexual violence, which will be debated before the Security Council on the 27th of July. We are currently preparing an event uh, on uh, 19th of June to commemorate the International Day on the Elimination of Sexual Violence in Conflict, which will actually focus on the impact of COVID-19 on CRSV survivors. And this virtual meeting will provide a platform for our senior women protection advisors from seven, seven different uh, uh, mission settings to share operational updates on how they are innovating and adapting mandate delivery in response to the new reality. My office has also been extremely busy in inputting into the different policy brief uh, that you mentioned that has been prepared uh, by the SG and, and their ongoing policy, policy brief uh, coming out. Maybe I'll stop here, Jorwin, and I would be happy to, to take on more questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, uh, I would like to ask you one follow-up question because um, Obviously, you, you are following developments around the world and, and the Secretary General is referring to this surge in violence against women during, during the pandemic. Um, what kind of patterns, if any, can you observe? What kind of reports do you get in from all your different contacts and offices um, around the world? Well, as you know, I have been, of course, focusing on, on conflict-related sexual yeah. violence, uh, yeah. although the uh, uh, brief of the SG was very focused on, 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 on domestic violence. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. But but even when it comes to CRSV, we have seen, and it, in spite of his uh, uh, call for a global ceasefire and the response that it actually got, unfortunately, I am receiving uh, I am receiving uh, feedback from my senior women protection advisors and other field practitioners, and uh, through my civil society advisory board and and local grassroots organization reports of, uh, and including uh, uh, peacekeeping mission reports of cases of sexual violence. For example, uh, in, in, in the DRC, uh, there was, uh, the, the numbers are staggering. In Eastern DRC, uh, we, we've uh, uh, judicial investigation being halted uh, upon the order of the governor on account of COVID-19. Uh, I have received uh, 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 information about cases in, in Mali, in South Sudan, where we, my office is working closely with humanitarian actors to provide the necessary support. Hmm. Thank but you. I think it's too, but I think it's too early to say whether it's on the increase. And I, I, as you know, uh, data is going to be scarce, uh, but we, we want to prevent it from happening. And I'm falling back a lot on, on literature that is available from pre previous pandemics that show the link between pandemics and, and uh, all forms of, of sexual and gender-based violence, including, including uh, conflict-related sexual violence. Mm. Thank you, Pramila. Uh, I'll probably come back to you a little bit later. I would like now to, to move on. You, you made reference to a number of, of countries in, in Africa. And I'm wondering, do we now have Helen with us? Helen? Uh, Helen hasn't joined us yet. She hasn't joined us. Okay. Okay. Then, then we'll go to is is uh, Lucia with us? I'm here. Can you hear me? Wonderful. Yes, we can hear you. Um, Lucia Baca, you you are a peace and armed conflict researcher at um, an organization called Colombia Diversa. Uh, and this is a leading LGBT rights organization that works for, uh, that has been fundamental to raising awareness about the conflicts, uh, the, the, the conflict in Colombia's impact on LGBT persons. Um, I would like, could you maybe t tell us a little bit about how you are working in Colombia now and how this COVID-19 situation has impacted your, your work? Sure, of course. Um, so a little bit of background uh, for those in the audience who may not be as familiar with our work. Since 2018, more or less, Colombia Diversa has been sort of documenting incidents of prejudice-based violence, so like SOGI motivated violence against LGBT people during the armed conflict. Um, and, you know, the goal of this work has been to promote their access to transitional justice after the peace agreement was signed in 2016. And so we've worked with approximately 30 victims um, who we're still in regular contact with in three departments across the country, some of which are the most sort of hardest hit um, by the armed conflict. And right now, um, we're seeing two things. Um, we're seeing some, you know, very specific impact on these populations. Um, I think, you know, two that I, I'd like to draw specific attention to are rising food insecurity and economic devastation. Um, a lot of the people that we work with, and I think I think this applies for LGBT people in general, but even more so for LGBT victims of the armed conflict. Um, you know, they depend on, you know, they work in an informal sector. And so they rely on daily wages, survive without job protections. And, you know, what happens is that when we're facing these social distancing restrictions, um, you know, with people that work as, that have been pigeonholed into jobs like hairstylists, makeup artists, domestic workers, sometimes even sex workers, um, they don't have any way to make ends meet. They don't have any way to put food on the table. And so, you know, they'll be calling us constantly saying, saying is there any way that we can get help from the government? Um, and unfortunately, the government has not been very proactive in, in helping out vulnerable populations during the quarantine. Um, you know, I, I venture to say that the government's approach just completely lacks a differential perspective, right? It doesn't take into account um, any vulnerable populations' needs, um, although there have been some isolated actions to that effect. Um, you know, and in some cases, we've seen that trans women have had to turn to sex work in order to support themselves and their families. Um, and, you know, we've tried, you know, we, we've been trying to, we did like an internal collection in the office, for example, to try to support some of the people that work with us. But unfortunately, that isn't enough because, you know, money is tight for everyone. Um, 
So that's one issue that, you know, that we've been facing and that even more so, you know, that victims of um, conflict-related sexual violence and gender-based violence have been facing. And the other, um, you know, which I think is important to draw attention to is the increase of risk of, of the increased risk of violence and, and discrimination, which is something that um, Special Representative Patton also mentioned, right? I think it's been said in a lot of um, spaces that COVID can act as a conflict multiplier, and that's definitely been the case for some regions of Colombia. You know, the sort of restrictions and, and the retreat from public space gives armed groups more room to sort of double down on armed compensations, on, on attacks. Um, or otherwise expand their territorial control via threats or extortion. Um, and we've seen that they're exploiting the lockup to ramp up attacks against human rights defenders, and that includes LGBT activists, um, because they essentially become certain targets, right? So victims, LGBT victims of the armed conflict who, um, you know, may be visible in, in their territories for one reason or another, either because, you know, for the simple fact that they're LGBT or because they're also activists, um, you know, they are now in a much more vulnerable position because they can't move around and sort of avoid the people that were once attacking them. Um, and so that's been another issue. There was actually one specific case um, of, of a gay leader who's been a longtime peace advocate from Medellin who was attacked stabbed three times a day after the quarantine was declared. Um, you know, he was stabbed by like several members of an armed group on the 25th of March. And um, you know, that was after he'd been denouncing that he was receiving threats from this armed group. But unfortunately, um, the, you know, the government hadn't done much about that. And so that's also, you know, a risk that, you know, we're facing right now. And, you know, I think um, Special Representative Patton's comments about adaptable leadership and, and it being anything as business unusual is also very much applicable because we had to shift our entire modes of work. And we've mm -hmm. also been working from home since mid-March. Um, and so that means that, you know, we're all separated and trying to figure out how to adapt everything that we had going on, including these activities to social distancing. And unfortunately, the, you know, for some things that just has not been possible. And that includes this field work that we were doing, uh, which is, you know, troubling not only because there are, you know, special anniversary. This, is an, this was an important advocacy, right, because we have the anniversary of, um, of the WPS Resolution 1325, you know, the 20th anniversary. We also have the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration. Um, and next year, we have important deadlines coming up for, you know, the Special Jurisdicts for Peace for the Truth Commission. And so not being able to do that field work has been, um, you know, has put a damper on our work a bit. Well, actually, a lot. <laughs> Um, because if we can't resume that work soon, then we won't be able to turn in some of the stories that we had wanted to, to help guarantee access to justice for some of these, for some of these victims. Um, and that truly really would be would be tragic, honestly. And unfortunately, you know, though there are some things that you can shift, just sort of like the virtual sphere. This isn't one of them. Not only because of you know the sort of like psychosocial and inhuman elements, human connection that you need when you're asking people to open up about you know some of the darkest and most um, Troubling, you know, the times of their past, but also because they don't have access to internet. And if they're struggling to make ends meet, like I said before, then you know they're, you know, they're not going to be, they're not going to want to talk about, you know, probe around those painful memories. Um, and it seems tone deaf to ask them to. You, you, you were talking about adaptable leadership. Um, obviously, that's something you, as an organization, have had to, to. Um, to do, but but what about the government and and their responses to COVID nineteen? Um, how has this impacted uh, LGBT persons particularly, and to what extent does the government response uh, respond to to the negative impact of of such um, of such uh, efforts? Uh, the government has been sadly very absent um, from sort of trying to ameliorate these impacts on LGBT people, um, including LGBT victims of the armed conflict. Um, so, uh, you know, something I have mentioned before is that overall sort of the national response, you know, the national emergency response to COVID has lacked a differential approach, right? It's, it's need blind, for lack of a better word, but in a bad way, in the sense that it doesn't account for the, you know, the differential needs of populations who may be more vulnerable right now. Um, mm -hmm. including women and black and indigenous communities, refugees, people in conflict zones, and, and of course that includes LGBT people. Um, you know, it doesn't incorporate a gender lens, let alone an LGBT lens. Uh, that's something that, you know, we've seen across the board, you know, Outright International released a study on this, and, and that's something that's been, you know, the case across the board of all over the world. Um, and 
I, I mentioned there have been some isolated efforts. You know, there's actually been one attempt by the national government to address the need of LGBT people specifically. That was in late March, um, which it means that it was basically when Colombia started to feel the impact of the pandemic. It was right at the beginning, um, because here the national quarantine was declared, I believe, on the 24th. And in, in that specific instance, the Ministry of the Interior sort of mobilized um, the, its networks to identify and include vulnerable populations, including LGBT people, on the government's list for grocery deliveries. So what they did was um, the, the minister, she asked the, people, like the liaisons with like different populations, including the LGBT liaison, to reach out to organizations like our organizations um, and sort of figure out how we could get, you know, to turn in lists, essentially, you know, lists that said, this is this person's name, this is where they live, and this is how they can receive um, the, the grocery delivery that the government wants to send to them. Um, you know, which on one hand was great because people, you know, were already starting to suffer. And, you know, they were very much happy to receive that grocery delivery. But on the other hand, does raise some, you know, worries for the post-pandemic context, because it means that the government is going to have a whole lot of information about where people live and where they are, who they are, um, which in a government prone to authoritarianism and in regions prone to corruption with often co-opted institutions, it's not. Um, it, it, right now, it's a lot of two evils, but after that, we don't know how that information is going to be handled. Mm. Um, and so that's been one attempt that the government has, has engaged in to try to address the needs of LGBT youth specifically, but it's sadly been the only attempt on a national scale. There have been other local attempts by sort of, you know, committed officials who are trying to address the needs of LGBT populations. And, you know, that has been very helpful where they exist. Um, but unfortunately, you know, that it, it, it leads to an uneven response, right? Because, because, because of the fact that there are these local attempts, these national institutions are unresponsive. Um, you know, going back to the case that I mentioned of the well, activists. You know, I mentioned before is that overall, okay. the national, the national. Are you with us still? There was suddenly some echo on the line. Uh, okay. I, if you can hear us, Lucia, we, we'll, we'll bring you in later. Uh, I think we'll just move on to, uh, to Jackie through. Uh, I believe you are there. Uh, we were supposed to, to introduce our African speakers uh, now, but we have technical problems. So uh, right. jo uh, Joanna has just joined us on the phone. Oh, Joanna has just joined us. Joanna, are you there? Can you hear me? Joanna, you'll just have to unmute your uh, phone and then it should the connection should work. Joanna, can you hear me now? Okay, while, while Joanna finds out uh, about the technicalities, uh, Jackie, we'll move to you. Um, uh, Jackie Thru, uh, she's a professor of international relations uh, and director at the Monash um, University's Center for Gender, Peace and Security. And you have been uh, doing some interesting uh, uh, work or research lately, gathering data from the Indo-Pacific region on sexual and gender-based violence. Could you, could you tell us a little bit more about your research, what kind of data you have gathered and, and what this data can sh show us or tell us? Are you there, Jackie? Okay. Hello, uh, everyone. Um, uh, delighted to be here. Thanks for the question, uh, Toron. Um, yes, we decided as one thing that we could do in a gender, peace and security center was to kind of map the, um, the impacts of COVID-19 on women, peace and security practitioners. Uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, so from basically uh, Iraq uh, through to through to the Pacific Islands. Um, and, you know, the women, peace and security practitioners work in a number of fields and, and not only uh, on 
gender-based violence protection. Um, so we were able to translate a survey in 13 languages. Um, it was in the field for two weeks. We tried to pull in all of our contacts, especially from conflict affected areas. Um, and we have some really interesting findings um, in a report we released just last Friday. Um, and what we found, um, I think, of particular relevance to uh, the impact of COVID on sexual and gender based violence is that um, of the 144 uh, practitioners who responded to our survey, 56% of them had no or reduced access to services and populations. Um, and that has huge implications for protection. So many of these practitioners were reliant on secondhand information for case management, and they were trying to, um, to connect with um, you know, victims and survivors remotely, uh, often through mobiles, um, you know, through Skype with, with varying success. Um, so I think real challenges remote working there in these areas. Um, and, uh, you know, and also, you know, in say a place like Sri Lanka, using mobile phone data, credit, really particularly difficult um, uh, for these practitioners. I think um, in somewhere like Myanmar, um, we had uh, direct reports there about increased risks uh, of um, sexual violence, um, where women are having to shelter and girls shelter together in tents. Um, in shelters uh, with unrelated men and boys um, and really concerned about their safety, uh, having to go to the toilet at night time, um, having to look for food uh, and water um, and also having to uh, go through military checkpoints and abide by curfews which are also militarized. Um, and I think this is a, 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 a you know, this is a pattern in a number of these areas. Also, uh, in the Solomon Islands, um, uh, one practitioner spoke about, um, you know, obviously the impacts, especially the economic impacts on women, the loss of income, the loss of jobs, and the impact that's having on households in terms of displacement, but also in terms of increased intimate partner and domestic violence. And whilst that might not seem conflict related, somewhere like Solomon Islands is a post-conflict setting. It had a, a very vicious uh, ethnic conflict um, and the levels of violence against women are absolutely egregious. While the rest of crime has really declined since the end of the conflict, the, um, the violence against women is at an epidemic level and it is, it is severe violence. And what we're hearing is that that, that violence is increasing. Um, so that's very concerning. Um, and the Philippines, we also have issues there about the ways in which um, women who want to access, uh, you know, their jobs, the, the market, uh, leaving quarantine, have also been trading, trading sex and other things. So in really desperate situations. So I think the key thing is that COVID um, is not just a conflict mo multiplier, it is itself a driver of conflict and a driver of conflict related sexual and gender-based violence, even though it's really, really difficult um, to report this type of violence, it was difficult anyway, it's much more difficult now. And you have that coercive control with regard to lockdown and militarized checkpoints as well. And so I think it's uh, that that's a real concern. With regard to our survey, we found that though the biggest concern of both individuals and for their organizations in the short term and the long term was loss of funding. And whilst many of these organisations were trying to respond to COVID, they were adapting their work and focus, 88% um, said they were impacted and in fact 68% said they were changing their focus, that only a small minority, 17%, said they had received any additional funding or funding at all for COVID related uh, response. Um, so I think that's a really big concern, the, the, this, the, the need for secure ongoing funding and COVID related funding to those women, peace and security practitioners on the ground who are working with vulnerable communities. Mm.
Yeah, the issue of lack of funding is something that we we hear being raised by many. It's it's an issue under normal circumstances, but has been exaggerated now during the COVID-19 pandemic. But is this something that those you you sent out this questionnaire addressed? Are they in dialogue with with donors and others um, uh, to to uh, raise money? Or are, are, are donors responsive to, to their uh, needs and requests? I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why we did this survey. Um, we, we got the sense that our own government, the Australian government, was keen to, to know what types of uh, needs and priorities, um, you know, organisations and practitioners had on the ground. Um, and I think there is a real opportunity now for donors to come together and use, I mean, ours is not the only survey. Obviously, the Women's Peace and Humanitarian Fund has also done one of theirs. I mean, Pramila spoke about the net, you know, her women protection advisors. There is, there is, an, a, you know, knowledge and there is emerging data. And I think it's a really a time now for donors to come together and figure out how they can collaborate um, to address some of these needs at this time. Because um, as we know, with other crises, uh, disasters, um, you know, fight the global financial crisis, uh, the impacts now will have a long-term effect and they will entrench, you know, gendered, unequal gendered power relations that will continue to uh, perpetuate, um, you know, high prevalence um, of this type of violence. Yeah. How, how relevant do you think the women, peace and security agenda is is to COVID-19? I mean, it, it, it's the big anniversary year this year. It's 20 years since uh, Resolution 1325 was adopted. And obviously at the time, this pan issues of how to handle pandemic uh, pandemics were not on the agenda. But uh, I guess this will now be more up in the open and discuss as as uh, the Security Council will address the Women, Peace and Security Agenda in October. How, how, how relevant do you think the Women, Peace and Security Agenda is? Well, I think the Women, Peace and Security Agenda is is absolutely tailored for these kinds of crises. Um, it, you know, if we think about what the four pillars of women, peace and security are, women's participation, uh, protection uh, of women's human rights and, and, and gender specific human rights violations, uh, relief and recovery, how to, how to build back better uh, in a gender equal, uh, equitable way, uh, and uh, prevention, how to prevent uh, you know, violence and insecurity. And, and so that women, peace and security is not just focused on armed conflict, it's focused on all types of insecurity. Um, so what is surprising to me is actually how in many countries, the women, peace and security agenda and the national action plans are not being activated to respond to this crisis. That is very disappointing. Um, I, I think we can see that definitely in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, there is a failure on the part of governments to actually use the frameworks that they have, you know, uh, obviously devoted significant resources to developing um, at this time. Um, and in particular, I think, you know, there are things like the need to strengthen reporting mechanisms um, in, you know, especially in quarantine context for sexual and gender-based violence, there's a need to be concerned about the adverse impact of emergency powers and militarization uh, on women's human rights. Um, and there obviously a need for, you know, as you spoke about before with um, Pramila and Lucia, for for relief and recovery, thinking about how you are going to recover from this pandemic in a way that doesn't entrench inequalities and discrimination. So this is the chance for all of us to advocate for the relevance of the Women, Peace and Security agenda um, and that certainly those advocates of Women, Peace and Security have never been entirely focused only on one type of insecurity or one type of, of, of threat. Mm. Thank you for now, Jackie. I, um, I, I, uh, I think now Joanna is with us. Joanna, can you hear us? Hi, Turing. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Joanna. I'm, I'm really glad that you were able to join us. Um, yeah. For those of us lis uh, those of, uh, listening to, to us, uh, Joanna, she is uh, the head of the Women, Peace and Security Institute uh, at the Kofi Annan Peacekeeping Training Center in Accra, Ghana. And, and Joanna, you, you work to integrate gender into the, the center's various courses and, and you, you provide training primarily to uniformed personnel, military and, and police. 
um, and you provide uh, specific training courses also on sexual and gender-based violence. Um, I understand that you have also been uh, under a lockdown. So how have you now handled the situation at, at your center? What kind of training are you able to provide or have you had to totally lock down all of your activities? How's the situation? Well, currently the country from the 16th of March, all training schools, all schools in the country were locked down, were asked to shut down. And since technically the center is a training institution or a school, we had to comply by the country's, um, uh, the, the national request, what is it? So as a training institution or as a school, we also had to shut down from the 16th of March. We have, uh, we technically shut down from that period until about the 25th of April, where we started running shift system at the office and primarily doing um, more of administrative and webinar and policy engagement. We haven't resumed our normal training programs as it is, as a date. We are hoping to begin re resuming our training programs, hopefully in August of this year. But in terms of our regular training programs in which we bring up, uh, we bring on board about 30 participants per training program, that has not happened since March of this year. The last training course was run in the first week of March and since then the center has been, has basically been on shutdown. So yeah, training courses have not been happening. We have been engaging with our, our participants or our students via Zoom or via um, through webinars and through that sort of engagement. But in terms of the regular training programs that we do at the center for two weeks or a week, that has not happened since March. Hmm. So what is the situation yeah. like in, in, in Ghana when it comes to COVID-19 and sexual and gender-based violence? Is, is this a topic that is high on the agenda also in, in Ghana? I think COVID is an agenda of every country right now. Um, the country, as I said, was on lockdown for about three weeks. We partially opened up. Um, schools are still shut down. Um, public places, some public places are still have not been opened. Um, some works have reopened. Um, certain areas have been open for um, use, but there is still a lot of caution, a lot of precautions in place in terms of movement. But a lot of people are still home. Jobs have been lost, incomes have been lost. Um, schools and places that were used, seen as havens for people who were suffering abuse at home have now been closed down and all persons are home. In terms of numbers, it's difficult for me to say there has been an increase because I don't have figures in front of me right now to speak to that effect. But if you look at the global pandemic as has been stated by the, um, the Secretary General and what has happened globally, I, I, if I, I'm, I'm to make a projection, I won't say Ghana is any different from any other country that has seen a rise in, in, in cases. Um, and and in, that, in that sense, are we worried? Of course we are. And we, we can only hope that once everything is sorted out in case of COVID and we begin the relief processes, we should be able to now put in place measures to address the aftermath of this. And, and of course, there will be issues after this. Of course, um, the police have been trying their best to add on to sexual and gender-based violence. There is a unit at the police headquarters that addresses these issues. They've tried to add, um, they've tried to continue to address this in addition to addressing the COVID issues, um, UNFPA has, uh, has assisted them to establish a hotline that persons can call in in case they have a case um, of, of um, to report abuse. There's also a hotline at the Ministry of Gender and Children's Social Protection in which they can also call in and report abuses or, and, and seek redress or seek assistance from the police service. So those numbers are available for persons to call in. And as I said, I don't have the figures in front of me right now to say that the numbers have gone up by this amount or by this percentage. But if I'm to make a projection based on the global numbers that we are seeing, then definitely there, there will be some increase in, in our country as has been in other countries. Mm. Th thank you, John. I hope you will be able to stay on the line with us. Um, uh, I would, line, uh, would like to invite in Inger. Inger Schelspeck, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, Inga, you, you have, you, you're a professor at the Center of Gender Research at University in Oslo and a research professor at the Prio 
GPS Center, and you have been researching conflict-related sexual violence for several decades now, and you have focused particularly on on the on the Balkans and been following developments in in that region and also in in in, in Greater Europe. Um, how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted SGBV in in the Balkans and in that region? Yeah. Thank you, Tudin, and thanks to the other speakers as well for um, great um, uh, comments. Uh, I thought that maybe um, my contribution here today, as you said, I'm a researcher and not uh, a practitioner in the field, but I have worked on the situation um, and done research in the Balkans on conflict-related sexual violence. And so I thought I could say a little bit about the Balkans, perhaps, and what I've followed there, and then perhaps give some reflections as to what sort of research questions we could ponder in this situation because I think that one thing that we see very clearly is the interconnect between uh, conflict-related sexual violence and gender-based violence in times of war and peace. And I know this is something also that Jackie has written about and talked about, and it's something that in the research community is, is a debate. How should we understand conflict-related sexual violence, and whether it should be seen as something unique to conflicts or something that has to do with other kinds of structures. And I think that the COVID-19 shows that definitely um, there are uh, um, uh, patriarchal structures and structures about gendered inequalities that now come into play in this uh, pandemic, within the pandemic, if you like. So I thought I could say maybe a few words um, about uh, the situation in the Balkans. It's based on uh, some informal conversations that I've had with friends in the region, but also an online um, report from the 21st of April. Uh, on a, from a journal called Balkan Insight, where they say that in the region, now figures just as others were pointing to show that, or people are working in the region, NGOs um, and social workers and others say that they experience an increase in gender-based violence. Uh, and they experience this by ways of people calling them and contacting them in, in many different ways, as Jackie was also talking about. Um, and But then at the same time, as there is this feeling that there is an increase and more people who need help, there's also a concern expressed that the um, authorities are neglecting the problem. And one reason for this is that while they, uh, the, the official uh, registering of uh, these needs for help have not are not don't correspond with the sort of inner official kind of uh, approaches that these NGO workers talk about. So, for instance, the Croatian Minister of uh, Interior said on, on a press conference on April 8th that there has been no increase in criminal acts of domestic violence in Croatia. Uh, meaning that, you know, so this will put this on hold, which is very often the case with these uh, issues that, you know, they, they yield for other issues and now that becomes uh, part of the background instead of being also something that we need to focus on in the COVID-19 situation. Uh, many victims, of course, are unable or very afraid to report violence and this is, of course, not unique to the Balkans. We see this all over uh, the world and we have oh, probably all seen stories also from France and we know from Norway that people are afraid um, to contact uh, or to, to seek help. Um, but uh, in the Balkans now and also in Europe in general where we now see that restrictions are being lifted, we many uh, worker NGO workers are saying that maybe we will now see an increase also in registered um, um, numbers so that the this can be used to address uh, authorities who are overlooking the problem. Uh, and then specifically to the situation of uh, conflict-related sexual violence, because of course the Balkans was, uh, the conflict both in Kosovo and in um, Bosnia were marked very much by uh, sexual violence. And uh, there, uh, one um, social worker from Kosovo says that, especially in families that they know of that had been uh, exposed and had experienced conflict-related sexual violence, the lockdown in itself is a trauma, but then the, the, the fear and in many cases also the experience of renewed gender-based violence is a 
tremendous trauma. And this is also echoed in other reports from the region, an OSCE report from the 27th of April, which raises a huge concern in Bosnia in particular that they state that 64% of women in uh, the Bosnian uh, or in Bosnia live in uh, families where they are were conflict affected in different ways. And they suspect and fear that the prevalence of partner violence and domestic violence will increase in these families in particular. And so the sort of uh, backstory of conflict related violence comes into play in a new uh, form, if you like, or creates a different set of uh, vulnerabilities um, in uh, the current um, COVID-19 lockdown situation, which can be very traumatic. And I want to underscore something that when I did many years ago field work in Bosnia with local health workers and uh, uh, others who worked with conflict-related sexual violence, but also uh, gender-based violence after the conflict. And one thing that they pointed out to me was that uh, oftentimes being a victim or being victimized by domestic violence is experienced as um, more hard hitting and more painful in some ways than conflict related sexual violence, which might seem uh, in a way as a contradiction. But what they explained to me was that this violence came, uh, the, the, um, so not conflict related sexual violence, but gender based violence or domestic violence came about in a situation uh, where they were in their safe place, so to speak, in their homes. This is completely different from the conflict situation. And it happens often over a longer period of time. Um, and the people who commit these acts are not the enemy, which is a big difference. It's your close family members. So the trauma of gender-based violence is uh, immense. And if you add that on top of a background of conflict and a background of war violence and a background of conflict-related sexual violence, it's a very grim picture that emerges. Uh, and so just to round off, I, I think there are some new questions that we need to ask in order to, when we get more knowledge about what has been going on, when people will be able to report more from the ground uh, and in different contexts, that we need to ask also uh, who are new uh, perpetrators of gender-based violence in this COVID-19 situation? What is their histories? What are the triggers? Uh, why do they sort, resort to this particular form of violence in this particular uh, context? Uh, and we know also from research from also other PRIO colleagues that there is a significant effect of armed conflict intensity and the risk of experienced domestic violence. So there's good reason to be very worried. Um, and we also, I think, need to look at what kinds, when we will get reports, what kinds of sexual violence is it that we're see. There are some reports that suggest that we are seeing a more intense form uh, of uh, uh, and a more aggressive form of gender-based violence. Uh, and um, so we need also to take that into account when we um, talk about or try to target uh, policy and practice responses. And then finally, I think that we need to carefully consider um, the situation for children. And especially if we also have the backdrop of the conflict uh, and perhaps also even conflict-related sexual violence in families where now gender-based violence is happening, the secondary victimization of children in these settings is very concerning. Um, and I think it's particularly concerning at a time when they also cannot be with their friends, they cannot go to school, they're, they cannot reach out and also seek help that they might need. So these were just some, some thoughts for me based on the research that I've done and the, the, what I've followed uh, with the situation in the Balkans. Mm. Th thank you, Inge. Um, uh, really a lot of food for thought there. Uh, I see that uh, that uh, Pramila Patton, you, you have asked for the floor um, or, or for the word. Uh, did you want to comment specifically on one of the others or is it a new? Yes. Yeah, please. Yes, I, would, I, would really like, I would really like to share with you some of the impact uh, of COVID-19 on the mandate uh, of uh, CRSV. And this is information that we have actually received from the field. Firstly, we know that uh, uh, CRSV, already a dramatically unreported crime, risks being completely obscured by the pandemic. Because in addition to, uh, to shame, stigma and fear 
of repercussions uh, that, that, that uh, account for the underreporting. Now we see that how the impos in, in, imposition of quarantine, curfews and other restrictions on movement are impacting uh, on reporting. There's also a limited access to uh, first responders uh, who often serve as first points of call. I mean, like as, as you know, even our senior human protection advisors, they are working from home. They have to respect uh, the curfews and the confinement. And they are really relying on their local networks, on religious leaders, on community leaders. There's also the fear of contracting COVID-19. That also is a constitute a barrier to reporting. But what is worrying is the uh, impact it's having on access to services, including life-saving intervention. And that is a direct uh, outcome of the pandemic. Uh, that is the increased burden on health services as a result of resources being prioritized for the COVID-19 response. And this contraction of routine health services means barriers to service provision for victims of sexual violence, including reduced supply of essential uh, services and access to sexual and reproductive health. And the challenges of availability and, and accessibility are even worse for refugees and IDP uh, women and, 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 and girls. Um, we also note that there is a change in referral pathway that, uh, that has occurred as a result of the pandemic. We see closures of shelters, we see closures of, of women-friendly spaces. In uh, information from, from the field that has come to us, in certain contexts, uh, COVID-19 pandemic has triggered the militarization of the health system. And that's also having negative effects for women and children to, to access. On the rule of law and accountability, uh, I, we, see, we, are, we are seeing a real impact. Of course, COVID-19 is posing special threats and challenges to the effectiveness of judicial system around the world. But when you talk about the lockdown of judges, uh, justice workers, prosecutors and lawyers uh, in conflict settings, uh, this lack uh, of access to justice really opens the door to a context favorable to, uh, to impunity. Uh, I mean, in all of our private countries, we see how judicial activity is paralyzed uh, with trials, important uh, CRSV trials stalled. We see a limitation on the availability and capacity to receive and process electronic data of sexual violence by law enforcement and judicial authorities. And we are also very concerned about guidance to limit the number of uh, people who are arrested and detained in an effort to limit prisoners' exposure to the disease. I had to uh, to actually send a letter uh, along with the RC uh, to the president of Central African Republic who came up with a ordering uh, the release of prisoners that actually included the release of prisoners convicted for CRSV cases uh, and, and I'm the response from, from, from the only exception that we made is sexual violence against minors under the age of 14. So all, all the rest uh, could potentially be, be released. In the, in the DRC, as I mentioned earlier, a very, very important judicial investigation with national um, judicial officers into a mass rape uh, was suspended. Uh, and, and, and I was in DRC in December and the, the same military judge explained to me what happens when, when there is a delay in judicial investigation. These survivors move and, and they are never to be found. Uh, they, are, they are displaced. And, and that's the end of the of the investigation and and, and, and justice. So these are some uh, some some very concerning trends that I really wanted to share with you. Uh, Pramila, can I just ask which country was it you mentioned that uh, the release of CRSV prisoners? Uh, that's that's Central African Republic. Central African Republic. Okay. Central African Republic. But at the same time, you see trend in, in Libya, for example, where they are releasing prisoners, but they are not releasing women and children. And again, I had to send a, a joint letter with, uh, with the uh, special envoy uh, and, and, and the US to Libya mm -hmm. to ask for the release. 
and, and in Central African Republic. Uh, and, and we are seeing this uh, all over the place, but I had to intervene personally through, through letters uh, for Libya and Central African Republic. Mm. Um, I see that there is a lot of, uh, of activity in, in the chat now, uh, a lot of questions. I'm, I'm wondering whether we should open up for, for, for that. Um, uh, Quoten, um, I'll just interrupt you really quick. I believe that Helen has now joined us. Has Helen joined us? Oh, that's wonderful. Helen, can you hear us? Helen? Can you hear us, Helen? We can't hear you. Maybe you're on mute. OK, well, I'll see what's going on and maybe you can take the Q&A first. Yeah, um, my colleague, you uh, Johanna, uh, she has been keeping an eye on on the chat. Uh, Johanna, are there any questions that uh, you would like to read up? for any of, uh, of the participants. I see that there are a few questions being raised to Pramila Patton, for instance. Yes, there are a lot of activity in the chat and we really appreciate that, so keep them coming. Uh, I was thinking that we could start with this question from uh, Raffaele Carvolo, and uh, that person is asking, there has been a huge uh, increase in domestic violence during lockdown. How can the VPS agenda and the national action plans be used as frameworks in support of women in this kind of situation of insecurity at home? So how can the national action plans and the uh, VPS agenda be used to help these women that are experien experiencing domestic violence? Was this a general question to everyone or was it to someone specific? I didn't quite get it. Uh, it was not to someone specific. We do have uh, one specific question to the SRSG and that's about um, UN personnel that are, let me find it. Uh, uh, it's about UN personnel that are, um, doing uh, sexual and gender based violence while they're on operation. And uh, if you have seen an increase in this during COVID-19, and if so, what are you doing to try to stop it? Hmm. May, maybe you would like to start, Pramila, you must unmute. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I just want to underline that uh, sexual exploitation and abuse is uh, um, is, is a reality, a, sh a shameful reality. And as you know, uh, since 2017, the Secretary General has come up, uh, has adopted a zero tolerance, has taken some very uh, um, important measures like removing SEA, sexual exploitation and abuse, uh, from my mandate uh, and has entrusted it to a special coordinator working directly on, on, under the SG, has appointed a victim rights advocate so that I unfortunately cannot give you uh, a lot of information because I don't cover the monitoring and, and reporting of these incidents uh, uh, anymore. Uh, but I can really tell you that the prevention and response to these cases are a priority for, for, the, for the organization. Of course, my office participates in the UN coordination uh, mechanism related to SCA and other patterns of misconduct. Uh, but there, there will be a report um, coming out very soon uh, on uh, an assessment report on, on trends related to SEA and, and the, the impact of COVID-19 in the, in the coming weeks. But I have actually alerted uh, my, my colleague, uh, victim rights advocate, on, on the specific vulnerabilities of women and children and the likelihood of, of, of an increase in SEA, hence the importance to be extremely, extremely vigilant. Because, like I said, uh, I, I did not wait. Uh, hard data is very scarce, but we have to uh, to take policy uh, 
and, and, and response uh, measures based on, on, on the body of literature that exists on the prevalence of, of SEA, for example, or the prevalence of other forms of sexual and gender based violence, just like different forms of co coping mechanisms adopted by, by families that are extremely vulnerable in this situation of pandemic, uh, notably through early and, 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 and forced marriage. Uh, so I am working very closely with, uh, with my uh, colleagues, the special coordinator uh, on SEA and the victim rights advocate. And my senior women protection advisors are also working with the victim uh, rights advocate in, in, uh, in the field. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pramila. Um, back to the question of, of um, uh, uh, national action plans and how COVID-19 efforts are integrated into to these. I don't know if any of you uh, feel a particular urge. Uh, Jackie, maybe you would like to pick up on that one? Sure. Um, I mean, every national action plan is different. And if we think about the Women, Peace and Security agenda, not just as a set of legal commitments or normative, but as, as normative commitments, um, I think it is broadly relevant as are other human rights uh, commitments by governments. Um, and I think when we have a Secretary General of the United Nations talking about gender based violence, which includes domestic violence as a shadow pandemic, then it is incumbent upon governments to respond to that. Um, and I think that maybe one thing to be considered is that new new mechanisms at this time become important. Um, I have heard a number of uh, countries speaking about the importance of, for example, at this time when the World Bank is giving loans to countries um, to assist with their financial situation as a result uh, you know, of the impact of COVID, that these loans should be conditional on governments responding to gender based violence. Um, so, you know, kind of a, a carrot and a stick there. Um, and I think, um, you know, there are other mechanisms. You can definitely now see women, peace and security advocacy organisations uh, such as Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, Madre. They are all focused on domestic violence at this time, even while you know, they may have been focused on so-called conflict related uh, violence before, but they are, all have campaigns on domestic violence. And so they are also working in country uh, to put pressure on governments. But I think it's also the responsibility of governments who are responding to gender based violence, to domestic violence, to also uh, have diplomatic conversations and use the tools that they have available such, you know, uh, in order to um, share their best practices and uh, and persuade states to respond there. Uh, Torin, you're muted. Sorry. Um, uh, thank you, Jackie. I, I was wondering, anyone else would like to respond to the question on national action plans and COVID-19? Uh, initiatives. If not, I believe we now have Helen on the line, do we? Can you hear us, Helen? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Wonderful that you uh, were able to join us. Um, uh, Jackie True just spoke about civil society organizations and advocacy, uh, and you are representing one of those organizations as the executive director of Women's International Peace Center. Um, you have worked for more than 20 years uh, on women's rights, gender, peace building, conflict resolution in, in a number of, of African countries, but also in Nepal. And I believe that you recently have done some interesting work on sexual and gender based violence among uh, South Sudanese refugees in Uganda. Can you tell us a little bit about your work uh, and what kind of data you have collected? Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so the work we are doing with the South Sudan um, women refugees is um, peace building and collecting early warning information about conflict. So we train uh, a network of um, women mediators uh, who live within the refugee camp, but also the host communities. 
the, the, the background is that we have more than a million South Sudanese refugees living in Uganda right now. And they've been having um, conflict with host communities as a result of res limited resources that they both have to share, land, water, and the rest of it. So the work that we do is conducting mediation activities uh, uh, among the host communities, but also within the refugee camps. Um, in terms of uh, sexual and gender-based violence, I can say that of COVID, we've had um, an indication of increase in the incidences of sexual and gender-based violence in, 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 in one uh, of the districts where we work specifically. In January, the data that we got from the police was 14 incidences were reported. In February, six incidences. In March, seven. But in April, the incidences went up to 27. So that is more than, you know, it's almost like 70% increase from March. And um, the reason being that um, within the refugee camps, for example, there's um, uh, limited food. The World Food Program has cut down on the quantity of food they are giving to refugees. Uh, uh, families are not able to meet up, you know, with this requirement. So it's increasingly becoming difficult for them. And because there is also existing trauma among refugees, you know, you find out that people are easily agitated. Just last week, we had a mediation meeting. There was a conflict and two people were killed. You know, so the incidences of violence and conflict amongst communities is increasing because of the, the method and the regulations that are, are, are being given uh, as a result of COVID. In South Sudan itself, we also follow in data. Uh, in April, uh, within a week, between April 17 and April 22nd, there were 11 incidences of, of sexual and gender-based violence. Uh, in a week in three states in, in Wau, Bentiu, and Juba. The, the, the kind of incidences that we have recorded in Uganda is rape, defilement, girls being forced to marry uh, because families can no longer take care of them, so they marry them out to get uh, money or items for their survival. Uh, so there are early pregnancies, uh, but also domestic uh, violence. Um, in, in South Sudan, two of the girls who were raped uh, were between the ages of 10 and uh, 13. You know, so those are, that is the nature of the kind of uh, violence that uh, you know, we, are, we, are, we are following and uh, collecting data on. Thank you, Helen. Um, I, I think we are, uh, we, I would like to move on now to, to uh, the, the questions that have been posed in, uh, in the chat. Um, I don't know, uh, Johanna, have you um, been collecting anyone in particular or should I just pick and choose? I have collected a few. We have uh, been getting a question uh, responding to men and uh, male victims of sexual and gender-based violence and how they are treated uh, as vulnerable group, especially during COVID-19 and if they are taken into account when looking at these issues during COVID? It's a it general is, question. A general question, yes. I can, I can respond, I can respond to this. Uh, I just want to, uh, to uh, highlight that my mandate uh, covers sexual violence uh, uh, against women, against women, men, uh, boys and girls. But even Security Council uh, resolution that establishes my mandate acknowledges that it's, it's, it is something that significantly impacts on on uh, uh, on, uh, on women and girls. Uh, since I, 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 I took up this mandate, I have been bringing to light, been focusing on sexual violence, especially in detention centers against men and boys. And all uh, our our policies and and, and, and programs and, and and response uh, include we, we we have taken a very inclusive approach. We are also addressing children born of uh, uh, of sexual violence. Uh, so we we have been extremely uh, inclusive. In fact, uh, the, uh, this is this has been at the heart of the of, of the UN response to this uh, pandemic. 
being being all uh, all inclusive and to address the plight of those that are most uh, vulnerable. And in the context of uh, of detention, uh, this is something that I, I have addressed very recently with the Libyan authorities, uh, for example. And to a certain extent in Syria and and and, and Iran. Hmm. Thank you, Pramila. Do you have more questions, Johanna? Uh, yes, we have a question to Joanna at the Kofi Annan Institute. And that is someone who is wondering, what is the government of Ghana doing to mitigate intimate and domestic sexual abuse and early marriages under lockdown? Joanna, did you hear the question? Are you still on the line? It seems like we might have lost her. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, then I can take a bit more general question. Yes. And that is, uh, can we say that COVID is a driver of conflict as well as sexual and gender based violence? Could you repeat the question again? Yeah. Uh, can we say that COVID-19 is now a driver of conflict, as we have seen that uh, domestic violence or sexual and gender-based violence has also been a driver of conflict? Who would like to pick up on that one? I, I, I can. I mean, like... Uh, if, if, uh, if, if you don't mind, uh, I mean, it's I won't say it's it's a, it's a driver, but it's not unrelated. For example, what has been observed, and this is something that the Secretary General himself before the Security Council, he emphasized, is that uh, the, uh, the discontent around the management of the pandemic is uh, is trigger triggering. Uh, more, more violence and, 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 and more conflict. It is, there, there is some fragility, uh, fragility of state which is resulting from, from the pandemic. And when you have fragility of state, then you have breakdown in, in, in law and order and with restrictions on your law enforcement authorities, then there is, there is an escalation. What has been observed also is that uh, the pandemic is uh, opens room for, for escalation of conflict where you have non-state armed groups uh, using that, that space that has that, that is, is open when government is focusing on addressing the pandemic. And terrorism, similarly terrorism is a reality as we have seen in the Sahel, for example, where the, the governments are struggling with the scourge, with, with the scourge of, of terrorism. And, 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 and the pandemic, they, they, they are seeing a window of opportunity to, to gain more space. So it is a, it is a worrisome, uh, worrisome trend. Yeah. Uh, I wonder, did I hear Helen? Did you want to respond to this question too? I think I heard your voice, but I'm not sure. Yes, I wanted to respond on the question of if if uh, sexual violence is a, is a trigger of conflict. I think it's the other way around, you know, that as a result of the regulations and the way that the response to COVID has happened, particularly, you know, in the place where I am in Africa, it has triggered, you know, the sexual violence against women. You know, so for example, if, if there's limited food in the house and the man demands for food and it is not there, a violent man is, is likely, you know, to be more violent. So I think that what has happened is the, 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 the regulation, the militarized nature of enforcement of, of, of the regulations of COVID has led to more uh, violence and conflict, but also it has also created, the response to COVID has created a vacuum. So for example, um, uh, uh, Insecurity institutions would rather focus 
on and forcing, you know, forcing people to stay at home out of public spaces instead of responding to STBV or domestic violence issues. So there's a kind of more focus and more uh, resources going into uh, the militarized nature of the response and not into human security issues that would have to do with uh, uh, sexual and uh, gender-based violence. So for me, it is the other way around that COVID has led to the escalation of sexual and gender-based violence um, and not the other way around. Mm. Th thank you, Helen. Mm. Um, I noticed there is... I uh, don't have any Sorry? I can also chime in here if... if yes, please, okay. please, Lucia, please. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so I, it's actually, it's, it's quick, um, but what I was going to say is that here in Colombia, it's our sense that it is also a conflict driver, but unfortunately, and this is one of the biggest obstacles that we're facing right now, is that there just is a huge information gap in the matter. Um, as even more so when it comes to LGBT, uh, LGBT people. You know, for example, that, so the Presidential Council on Women's Equality um, has an observatory specifically focusing on women. And they've indicated that in the first month of quarantine, reports of life-threatening situations of violence against women have increased by 553%, right? And most of those reports are domestic violence. That is, and you know, that is a very, more than alarming increase um, in reports compared to the same one month period of, of last year. You know, it's been like, I think, um, 209 reports in a one, in a, in a one month period. But unfortunately, um, you know, there's still a gap when it comes to actually tying those, to seeing which of those incidents um, actually relate to the armed conflict and there's no disaggregation, right? We don't know how many of those are lesbian women. We don't know how many of those are bisexual or trans women. Um, so that's something that's uh, very important to keep in mind. Um, but there's, you know, a huge information gap, and that's actually something that, you know, even donors and other governments, you know, especially considering what um, Jackie was saying earlier about, you know, um, you know, other governments were offering loans, and making them conditional on, on requirements to actually address gender-based violence. You know, one thing that needs to be part of that response is actually to monitor the situation and to get information on what's actually going on, so you can have responses that are based on that information. Um, and another thing to keep in mind, which I think is important and, and tying back to one of Inger's points, is that I think this situation also is showing the interconnectedness between conflict-related gender and sexual violence and also, um, you know, conflict and, and also non-conflict related, right? Sexual violence and gender-based violence in, in, in peacetime. You know, I think in Colombia, it's, it's a little bit strange because in some, you know, you have certain conflict zones, but others that are, you know, not at, not at all experiencing the armed conflict, you know, directly. Um, and so you can see that comparison, but you also see that the underlying structural conditions that make LGBT people and women uh, more vulnerable to armed conflict, right, and to, our, to sexual violence um, and to other forms of gender-based violence are also the same structural conditions that are making them more vulnerable to the pandemic. Right, you know, for example, if you have an LGBT person who is kicked out of their homes in a conflict zone early, you know, early in their childhood because they are LGBT, that is going to open them up to facing armed violence by the armed actors that are, are operating in that area. Um, and so that's something that, you know, we're seeing right now can also be a bridge uh, between these different types of violences and that needs to be addressed by these sort of more informed responses toward both, you know, gender-based violence in peacetime and in war. Thank you, Lucia. Uh, Jackie, did you want to, to respond to this? Sure, if, uh, can I have the floor after, after Jackie? Yes, please, yes. I just wanted to make a brief point, um, building on what Lu Lucia has just said, and I um, and the question was 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 about is is COVID a driver of conflict? And I think um, it's maybe important to sort of also separate the issue sometime of conflict and COVID because con COVID is a crisis and it mirrors some aspects of conflict, even in so-called mm -hmm. relatively stable societies. And just relating back to what Inga said earlier. Those of us who are scholars uh, do actually question or at least suggest that there's a continuum of, of gender based violence, right, in conflict and relatively stable situations. And that is what is really striking about the COVID pandemic is that even though there's great variation in sexual and gender based violence, we do see this common global pattern. So I just wanted to just point to a couple of things from we have been doing what's called a Melbourne experiment 
studying our city and all the impacts of COVID, including the impact on violence and gender-based violence. We've found many more men are calling helplines and health lines, primarily as perpetrators. So they are feeling stress and they, they're aware enough and there are some services available in a relatively stable, wealthy society, well-resourced society, and so they are accessing those. We are seeing, because we have just the first survey on this back, we're seeing an increase in the severity and frequency of violence against women in the home. And we are seeing an increase in first-time uh, domestic violence reporting by women. So who have never reported before and the and complexity of their needs, as well as difficulty in accessing services due to surveillance, you know, in the home over the use of a computer, or the phone and so on. So this is like, you know, society which you might say is, you know, relatively privileged, um, certainly not in, in, in conflict as we conventionally define it. And yet these are the impacts. Um, having said that, I would say that just prior to COVID, we had a murder of a woman and her three children by her partner, a vicious murder. And we have had, I think, up to 22 killings of women during the COVID lockdown So in, the, in Australia. So I think it is actually, you know, for those of us who, 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 uh, who use this concept of the continuum of violence against women, I actually think we are seeing that. Uh, at this time, and that even though there are there's great variation, we should actually see some commonalities across societies, regardless of their level of fragility. Thank you, thank you, Jackie. Um, we are coming close now to to the end, but there is one question uh, that I would like to bring to your attention because since we are now in a a very peculiar situation under lockdown and uh, you, Jackie was talking about uh, the difficulties of getting access uh, to those in need um, uh, and there is one question from from a Prio colleague actually um, um, and she is asking um, uh, to all speakers who have received information from practitioners on the ground what are the possibilities of using digital technologies like smartphones and messaging apps for practitioners and CRSV survivors to connect in order to provide access and support, gather information about CRSV uh, incidents, etc. Digital technologies become a useful tool for practitioners during COVID-19 pandemic to reach survivors or are there limitations? It was a kind of a big question, but does digital technologies open up new opportunities, do you think? Is this something that is being discussed, for instance, at, at the UN? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in, uh, Torun. Uh, indeed, I think, I think modern technologies uh, is something that the UN has been encouraging uh, for a long time, uh, and that uh, humanitarian uh, frontliners uh, have, been, have been using uh, extensively. Uh, my office has partnered with, with NGOs like, like uh, uh, Physicians for Human Rights in, 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 in the use of, uh, uh, of modern technologies, uh, but it comes with its limitation in many of my priority countries, I have, I have to, uh, to, to confess. Uh, and, and what is exacerbating, uh, is impeding the use of modern technologies, for example, in a place like Cox's Bazaar uh, or, or Myanmar is when internet is down uh, mm -hmm. and that's by choice uh, and, and it's, it's making it extremely, extremely difficult. Uh, I've seen this in Myanmar uh, where internet is, is down uh, in Cox's Bazaar, so even to, uh, to ensure that the, the Rohingya refugees get information about COVID-19 is extremely difficult and the government is extremely reluctant to reconsider. It's, uh, it's again uh, where we see a shrinking of, of civic space uh, on, on the ground of, of uh, terrorist activities uh, in the refugee camps. Myanmar uses the same uh, arguments, uh, but we, we are seeing this in, unfortunately in, uh, uh, in other, other, other places. Uh, 
But there's, there's one thing that, that I, I really want to, uh, to flag uh, uh, to him before we, uh, we, we part, because we have addressed many, many issues. Yeah. But I think uh, one visibly striking trend, uh, which was observed since the very first week of the crisis, and which, uh, which, which prevails, is the low representation of women in public policy uh, uh, making related to COVID-19. And I think this is, for me, the, maybe the most uh, worrisome. And as we, we discuss the impact of COVID-19 on the WPS agenda, uh, we don't know what's going to happen in October, uh, whether we're going to have uh, a full um, uh, celebration of uh, the 20 years of, of uh, Security Council Resolution 1325 and, and talk. But, but I think to be to, to effectively combat the pandemic and all its implications, we all need to be part of the response. And, uh, and, and unfortunately, this has not been the case. And the shift to online discourse uh, is also contributing to, to narrowing the space for, for women civil society organization to operate and, and uh, undertake urgent advocacy and service delivery in support of women's rights. And I just wanted to flag this so that we are all mindful. And if we are, there are other events to be organized, I think we should focus on, uh, on, on, on that. We've, uh, uh, these talks is, is, is another, uh, I'm, I'm extremely concerned that, that uh, women's organizations have completely uh, uh, lost their space in Security Council discourse, for example. So it, it has huge implication on the WPS agenda. On, on the, there are protection concerns, but the participation is also uh, extremely, uh, extremely problematic because the first thing that the SG did was his global, uh, his call for a global ceasefire. And we know that coronavirus ceasefire can serve as a springboard for uh, into a peace process. And, and, and now it's, it's really crucial that women are engaged as part of efforts to develop comprehensive and sustainable peace agreement. And, and women are simply not there. And I can give you many examples, whether it is Sudan, whether it is South Sudan, uh, uh, Libya, Afghanistan. And, and, and we have hard evidence to, to, to show that women are, are losing, uh, losing their space as conflict resolution efforts are moving online. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pramila. Uh, I think that actually was, uh, although worrying, uh, a good uh, summary <laughs> of, uh, of, uh, of this event and also pointing a little bit forward. Um, we asked the question, is, is, uh, is there a hidden pandemic? And I, I, I think it's not hidden any, anymore. We are fully aware of this. It's more a question of how do we now effectively respond to it? Um, we have come to a close. I'm really so sorry that we had so many technical problems. It, uh, I'm, I'm afraid it ended up us jumping a little bit back and forth, but uh, I hope that everyone that has been listening in or watching still have found this to be useful um, and that you have got information and knowledge uh, that you can use in your, in your work wherever you are. Uh, I would like to thank again uh, the speakers, um, Pramila uh, and Jackie, of course, you are now late into the night. So thank you so much for, for staying with us and thank to all the other speakers too. Um, the next seminar in this series will actually be hosted by the Monash uh, Center. So Jackie, would you maybe just say a few words about the topic and the date? Well, you are pushing me at near <laughs> midnight. Um, it is going to be looking at the impact of COVID-19 on, uh, on, on violent extremism, something Pramila already mentioned tonight, um, and particularly from gender perspectives in terms of the recruitment of men and women and how groups are seeking to attract more supporters um, by moving into that space, that vacuum. Um, that governments are often, uh, you know, not uh, when governments are often not taking care, not being responsive to populations. It will be next June, June the third. Um, and please check all of our Twitter accounts for the exact time. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Pramila, Helen, Inger, uh, Lucia, uh, Jackie.
Who am I forgetting? Joanna, thank you all for, for joining in and thanks to all the rest of you who's, who've been listening and watching. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Toron.